This is the Ancient and Medieval History Lecture for Thursday the 7th? Today is 7th or the 6th? 7th. Thank you. Uh, of October 2021. And what we are working on now is our own society's creation myth. Something that most people in our society accept without criticism as the likeliest of origin stories. But because it's an industrial age rather than a pre-industrial uh, story, you have the emphasis not on why things are the way they are, but on how they might have happened. It's a science-based myth. We don't know what came before. Before the universe, we have no idea what existed, if anything, if you could even call it existence. Then, bing, geometric point, boom! The universe explodes into existence. In its early moments, it is the era of solid light, an unusual state that is neither matter nor energy, but a bit of both and a bit of neither. Eventually, empty pockets begin to form, then the solid light and the proportion of the universe changes from a mostly solid to a mostly empty universe, at least as regards matter. That's about 14 and a half billion or thousand million years ago. This early universe is filled with debris, dust, rocks, things like dust and rocks. And the two motive forces in the universe begin to play out. <laughs> One of these forces is inertia, which is the tendency, as Newton once said, for an object once placed in motion to remain in motion. The other is gravity, which Newton described as a mysterious attractive force. In other words, matter gets lonely and it likes to come together. Uh, but Einstein describes as mass creates a dimple in space-time which tends to draw other objects in. It's at least the imagery he used. In any event, whenever something is in an orbit, like the moon around the Earth, what's happening is you have a balance of the two forces. Uh, inertia wants the moon to go flying off into space. Gravity wants the moon to get sucked directly into the heart of the Earth. These forces are roughly in balance. And so the uh, moon describes an ellipse, a rounded course, not perfectly spherical, or not perfectly circular, but a rounded course, an elliptical course around the Earth. It is both falling and flying off at the same time in such balance that it tends to curve. The, gravi the gravity force of attraction <laughs> is sufficient so that even you or I, were we in deep space with spacesuits, if we were close enough, would tend to drift towards one another because we have sufficient mass to produce a microgravity field. That's what happens to the rocks and the dust. They begin to clump together to form masses. And the bigger the mass, the more powerful the gravity field. When you quizzers are done with the quizzes, please put them on the shelf. This builds on itself like a chain reaction. More mass, more pressure, more friction, more heat. More mass, more pressure, more friction, friction, more heat. The greater the mass, the greater the attractive force, the greater the amount of gunk that's brought in, the greater the friction as it moves into position, the greater the pressure within the heart of this thing, uh, the greater the force of gravity to attract more stuff in. And eventually this produces, boom, the first star as gravity ignites the dust. As gravity ignites the dust, 
about 13,000 million years ago, 13 billion years ago, the first star is born. Now, other stars begin to appear all over the universe as this process is repeated almost ad infinitum. Stars also have gravity. And they tend to group together with this gravity force attracting them. They still have their inertia, whatever direction speed they were moving at uh, tends to continue, but they tend to drift into relation with one another. But there are other objects or items in the universe which also have attractive force. If we were to look at gravity like a sheet held taut by all of us around the perimeter of this classroom, and you were to toss a bowling ball into the heart of that sheet, if we all remain taut, either the bowling ball would bounce into one of us, if it's possible. That would be nice. The bowling ball is big and heavy. Or the fabric of the sheet would fail. And the bowling ball would make a hole in the sheet and bounce off the floor, probably breaking the floor in the process. We don't know exactly why hypermasses form, but a hypermass or a black hole is so heavy and dense that for all intents and purposes, it tears the fabric of space-time. It's almost a hole in space-time. Its attractive force is so great. By the way, apparently a telescope recently got their first image of the event horizon of a black hole within the last week or two, which is incredibly exciting. And it, it, you know, it, it, the reason we recognize it is it seems to look like we think an event horizon would look, which is this sort of <coughs> fringe area around complete darkness. And what we see is this aurora of light, this nimbus of light around a completely empty space bereft of, devoid of light. That event horizon is created by the gravity, which is so intense that even wavicles of light itself cannot escape. The photons that make up the light fall into the center. They are drawn into the center. So the nimbus of light is the coruscating light as it is being drawn in at the last moment that any hint of that light can escape to the outer realms. The rest of it is slurped up into God knows what. There are all sorts of mystical theories about what black holes are. Maybe they're the scrubbing bubbles of the universe. Maybe they're windows into other realms of reality. We don't know. What we do believe is that at the heart of every galaxy, is a black hole, a supermassive black hole, like the one that we think is at the shapely center of our galaxy. So let's talk about that. 13 billion years ago, stars formed. Between 10 and 13 billion years ago, the first galaxies formed. Galaxies can take a wide variety of uh, shapes. There are nebulae that are sort of globular, there are lenticular galaxies that look like a lens. Uh, our galaxy is a bit lenticular. It's also a whirlpool galaxy in that um, everything is being slurped towards the center. Like if you pulled the plug out of a drain, you would see the water curling in a certain fashion. That's a whirlpool effect. If you were in Australia or New Zealand or South Africa, you wouldn't see that in the same fashion. Does anyone know why? make your geography teacher proud. What is different about the way that drains drain, that water drains, uh, in uh, places like South Africa, Australia, or New Zealand? Yeah. Is it about which hemisphere you're at? It's about which hemisphere, and what happens depending upon the hemisphere? 
the like the, the, the water kind of like comes in it's like that but then the other one's kind of like that you know yeah exactly and uh, since you couldn't at home see what she was doing when she was going that and that, in our part of the world, in the northern hemisphere, water drains counterclockwise. In the southern hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and many other places, water drains in a clockwise fashion. And what that has to do with is the way that the earth rotates. We in the northern hemisphere experience rotation I mean, to all intents and purposes, it feels the same, but water knows the difference. So water whirls in a counterclockwise fashion in the northern hemisphere and in a clockwise fashion in the southern hemisphere. In any event, the Milky Way galaxy seems to be working in a clockwise fashion. Ten billion years ago, the Milky Way galaxy, our own galaxy, begins to form. So one third of the uh, history of the universe in our Milky Way galaxy forms. It is immense beyond belief. You could travel thousands of parsecs towards the center or towards the edge and you wouldn't reach the center or the edge. The closest edge of the galaxy is above the lens or whirlpool or below the lens or whirlpool. But we're still talking countless light years, countless parsecs of space, just massive, massive size. And the Milky Way is a drop in the bucket compared to the rest of the universe, which is made up of myriad galactic clusters and superclusters. The Milky Way is merely one. <sighs> Nearby, is the Andromeda Galaxy. And aside from being the setting of the worst mass effect, mass effect game ever, the Andromeda Galaxy is about twice as large as ours. And we have uh, indication that the supermassive black hole at the heart of Andromeda is about twice the size of ours. The uh-oh moment comes when we realize that the Milky Way and the Andromeda are on a collision course. At some point in the future, I don't remember how far. It should be long after I die, so I'm not going to worry about it too, too much. Um, the Milky Way galaxy, composed of countless tens or hundreds of millions of stars, maybe more, and the Andromeda galaxy, composed of about twice as many, are going to flow into one another. And the Milky Way's black hole and the Andromeda black hole will tend to swirl into orbit around one another like Trojan orbit moons until eventually, being the more massive, the Andromeda black hole will swallow the Milky Way black hole, creating an even greater one. Now, what will be done to the delicate arrangement of stars, which in our galaxy is divided into the Perseus arm, the Orion arm, to where we are the Sagittarius arm, which is connected. What will be happen to the, to the same pattern that we see in Andromeda? Uh, period one is right there. No, 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 no. One down. There. What will happen is chaos. The forces that hold solar systems together might also be uh, disturbed uh, out of all recognition. Now, it doesn't mean just destruction. The universe, like free market economics, is a process of creative destruction. Destruction always produces, no time please, another um, opportunity. But our galaxy, our island universe, will come to an end as it is in its current state when it and Andromeda come together. In any event, that's one third of the way through universal time as we understand. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? I assume you'd ask, but I'll just ask in case. Okay. Yes. So, I don't want to sound rude or pretentious, but I'm trying, I'm kind of struggling to see how this fits in with, like, because it's ancient and medieval history, and we're talking about our modern creation myth, and I'm struggling to see the connection and trying to, like, okay. look at the similarity. My generic answer is not intended to be rude either. As to pretentiousness, I do that effortlessly. Trust me. I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this for over 20 years. Um, I'll tell you what it has to do with it, though. You can always ask. Just don't ask skeptically. 
how does this fit? No, yes, how does this fit in? And you're, we're wonderful at that episode. I'm just saying that in general terms so that you understand. You are part of this process. You are modern 21st century Americans at the moment. As such, it is important that you are able to understand, connect to, relate to the world of the past. Most people have an instinctive reaction to history, like it's fiction, or like it happened to other people. In fact, to some people, the word history is synonymous with irrelevancy. That's just history. Get over the past. Kill the past, as Kylo Ren said. That's not what history is. History is what happens to people like you and me. They are not different from us, except culturally, technologically. But as creatures, they're the same as us. Many people look with condescension upon the creation myths and the other myths of the past, almost with disdain or contempt, as if they're mere superstition. There's no such thing as a mere superstition. There are beliefs that people are willing to live for, die for, and kill for. Those beliefs have to do with the fundamental meaning of life, the universe, and everything. What I am doing by going through this creation myth is, first of all, giving you the truth that we have ours. And even though we may assume that ours being rooted in science is somehow superior to those thick-headed primitives who used to believe in gods, we're taking a hell of a lot on faith. Number one. Number two. I am illustrating to you or introducing you to a set of assumptions that the people around you, whether you yourself believe this or not, have. Number three, I'm <laughs> illustrating for you the most ancient of history, which is natural history. The history of the world before human beings, as we understand it through scientific theory. We think of a year as a reasonably long time. We think of a lifetime as a very long time. But in the scale of a tree, it's not much at all. On the scale of a mountain, even less. But even trees and mountains are fairly transient. They come and they go. As at the beginning of the year, when I introduced you to the scale of the universe through the little films that we saw, I am introducing you to how very old our world is, according to the current belief. So there's my answer. I could go on, but I hope you get the idea. In any case, I think it's valid, and I think it's important. And they trusted me with the power to make such decisions. <laughs> go. Uh, so, for the just the moments where it was, uh, it was dense light that was existing in the entirety of, the, of what was the universe. How long would that have been? Would it have been? First of all, since space, time, and gravity all intermingle as I understand physics, <coughs> talking about time in our sense is confusing. I don't think it would have been that long. But with that long on a universal scale, you're still probably talking, at the very least, a million years, probably several million years, with the incandescent hot explosion in its earliest. But I don't know. Uh, 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 certainly, if you've got five genuinely skilled quantum mechanics physicists uh, to come in and talk, they could talk about theories that would say, well, maybe it was just a few seconds. Yeah. Um, but what is a second when the entire universe is an expanding ball of incandescent plasma? Yeah. So, not long by the universe's standard. Yeah. Does that answer? Yeah, it was, uh, because, and then where would that, the density of, and just the mass of that light even go? Because well, what it did is it dispersed. Yeah into the matter and energy that we understand today. We understand that there there is energy, there is matter, they are different. Yeah. But at one time they weren't. So basically they become the universe. Dan, if you want to shut the fan off, please ask. Uh, do you want to shut the fan off? Uh, we'll try it. If I end up feeling stuffy, what I'll do is I'll ask you to move and turn the fan back on. But for now, okay. Um... So everything that is, was, or shall be is 
potentially in that explosion. And it comes out and fills the universe. Yeah. As the universe becomes larger, the proportion of matter that settles out is smaller than the volume of the universe, and it gets smaller and smaller as a proportion as time goes on. Yeah. Right now, the space between stars and galaxies is, is expanding. One wonders if the space between the subatomic particles in every atom is expanding also. We don't know, because all of our measuring equipment is composed of atoms, molecules, and so forth. What I really take away from all this is that at when you talk about something that is old enough or big enough or small enough, the laws of reality that we understand, that action precedes consequence, break down. Quantum mechanics, the physics of small, small things, and astrophysics, the physics of really, really, really big things, all deal with realities that make what we take for granted as normal, the world of our senses, the world at our scale, the world in our tempo. None of that is true. Our world is a world of shadows at the subatomic level. The subatomic particles that make up the atoms <laughs> of the most active part of our brains is not significantly different from the subatomic particles, particles that make up the air between us, the rocks below us, or the heavens above. So the answer ultimately is beyond a certain point, I don't know. I don't know, Matt, if anyone really knows. Yeah. Anything else? No. no. Okay. Emma? Okay. So I'm glad you asked both of those because I might have forgotten to tell you things. Talk to Mr. Uh, Sabaki or to Mr. McCormick or to any of your science teachers and see what they say about these. They, no doubt, will give you a much more up-to-date picture than I have. I'm telling you what I know. Okay. Within our military, this is the last thing we did uh, yesterday, and I, I sort of messed it up because I was trying to hurry. Within our galaxy, about well, just over 5,000 million years ago, there was a nearby star reaching old age. And when stars reach a certain point in their development, some of them, in effect, decide that instead of slowly diminishing, that they will expend their atomic fuel, their hydrogen, in an orgy of brilliancy. And that's called going nova. When a really big star does that, that's called supernova. Our sun probably will go nova at some point in the far future. When that happens, its surface will expand out towards the Earth. No one knows exactly how far. It's entirely possible that the surface of the sun, at least in the initial few centuries or millennia after the star goes nova, will be beyond the orbit of the Earth. What is certain is that when the nova explosion happens and the sun begins to expand, the gravitic shock wave that hits the Earth will destroy it as long, along with Mercury and Venus and Mars. Uh, the asteroids will be atomized, and the blast effects might even radically change Jupiter and the moons around it, Saturn and the moons around it. Probably the outer gas giants will have the least direct effect, but they'll have some. Nearby, as stellar distances go, a star goes nova and sends out a gravitic shock wave in all directions. Locally, there is a dust cloud. That dust cloud is composed of all of the various cosmic elements that uh, exist in our part of the universe. And when the shock wave hits the dust cloud, it begins a process of compression, which lights the gravitic engine, the gravity engine. By compressing the cloud, it creates masses within the local dust cloud, the debris cloud, which cause gravity to form. And as with the very first star, this process of attracting mass which is going to rub against each other and have friction, 
which is going to press upon each other and have pressure, which is going to produce heat, which is going to make the object more massive and attract more objects and more stuff in. Ultimately, gravity ignites the dust in our part of the universe 5,000 million or 5 billion years ago. And our star Sol is born. Now, when Sol first existed, it was surrounded by an accretion disk of matter. Again, rocks, dust, minerals, elements, all that stuff. Now, again and again, we see a lens whirlpool type effect with gravity. The Milky Way galaxy has that shape. And what happens to the accretion disk around the sun is it begins to flatten out as the various rings around the sun attract one another. And these rings then begin to come together. As the rings begin to coalesce, you have the formation of the early solar system's planets, including the Earth. The Earth is about just over 4 billion years old. Sun's 5 billion years old. So it took almost a thousand million years for the Earth to become a planet. The Earth and the other planets begin to form. Likely there was a planet between what is now Mars and Jupiter. We know this because there is an asteroid belt there now. And that asteroid belt seems to be the likely remains of a planet that ended up being ripped apart by forces after it, it had solidified. We don't know. What we do know is that the early solar system was a very busy place. Lots of meteors, comets, asteroids, lots of smashy smashy, to use a scientific term. So, the proto-Earth is orbiting the sun, minding its own business. What's that? Oh my! Another planet wings into the Earth. Both planets are big. I think it's called Thea. In any event, the other planet hits the Earth. And the Earth almost completely disintegrates like the asteroid belt. But then the gravity forces of the mass of the Earth and Thea come together and form a new hybrid planet, a Rhesus peanut, peanut butter cup planet that has chocolate and peanut butter, that has the proto-Earth and Thea all blended together. Now, not all of the mass of these two worlds were collected into the planet. Some of the mass was a disk uh, around the Earth, a ring around the Earth, that ultimately forms our moon, Luna. This theory develops after Americans go to the moon from 1969 through 1972. They bring back moon rocks. And the moon rocks seem to indicate that the Earth and the moon are made of the same basic stuff but that there are, there is evidence that there were two original worlds. So around the proto-Earth, the moon coalesces, the Earth is coalescing, and the moon ultimately forms. Okay. Any questions before we move on? So like, why is our planet called Earth? Well, remember, when we named our world, it wasn't a planet. It was the only world in existence as far as the people who named it were concerned. And that deals with paganism. Pagans believe, polytheists believe, that Mother Earth is the source of life. Whether that source comes from her own fecundity or her own uh, ability to procreate or whether that comes from the earth mating with the sky or something like that, the earth is where we plant seeds and they grow into food or trees or thorns or whatever. Everything depends on what comes out of the earth. 
the ancients understood probably better than most modern people how the food chain works because they were part of it. They were much closer to it and they were much more concerned with survival. So what the ancients would do is they would propitiate the gods, the goddess of the earth at harvest time. A uh, holy day, I guess you can call it. A holy day that's coming up is All Saints Day. However, the night before All Saints Day is called All Hallows Eve, or Halloween, when we dress up and say trick or treat, or we dress up and give candy to those who come and say trick or treat. That is based on a much older holiday of the Celtic Druids called Samhain. Samhain was a harvest festival. It happened at the conclusion of the harvest when the food had been brought in. It's the same time the Germans have Oktoberfest, but Samhain, and, which is also a celebration of the conclusion of the harvest. But Samhain looked forward to the next year. How do you make sure that Mother Earth is going to give forth her bounty, that there'll be good crops, enough crops to feed everyone? Blood. Blood right sacrifice. So you sacrifice a king, a virgin, or a fool, along with a bunch of beautiful animals and perfect plants in a giant wicker statue in the form of a man. You light it on fire as the sun leaves the sky. As darkness falls, these sacrifices are consumed, and hopefully the goddess of the earth and the gods around her will bless next year's harvest so that we can all survive. I go into that detail so that you understand we live on the earth. The earth is where our food comes from. So it makes utter sense that we would call our world by the same name. Make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. As the earth forms, it settles out and what I'm giving you now is a basic sense of the geology of the Earth. Heavy things, and this is similar to the Chinese yin-yang myth, heavy things settle into the center. At the heart of the Earth is a two-layered nickel-iron core, basically a solid stone metal object. There's the inner core and the outer core you just need to remember. At the heart of the Earth there is a core. And the core seems to be rotating in the opposite direction as the surface of the Earth. This is going to have an effect later. So at the heart of the Earth is a core, and honestly the core should be slightly bigger as a proportion, but, but this will do. Above the core is the vast majority of the volume of the Earth. The volume of planet Earth is dominated by what is called the mantle. The mantle is composed of molten rocks and minerals and metals and gems, all molten, with something like the consistency ranging from rock to soft-serve ice cream. But it's soft-serve ice cream that is so incandescently hot that if you got anywhere near it, you would combust before you even touched it. Literally, your flesh would catch fire. The mantle is a roiling, semi-liquidic mass that is the majority of the planet. Now, at first, that mass was open to space. But outside of the effects of the sun on the dark side of the Earth, space is cold. Very, very cold. So the very, 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 very thin top layer, only a um, couple hundred miles thick, solidifies and forms the crust. The crust is where we do all of our business. We have never penetrated the crust. The deepest mines don't come anywhere near the bottom of the Earth's crust. There are those who believe that at some future point we will dig boreholes into the mantle and the heat basically creating man-made volcanoes 
and the heat from these man-made volcanic vents from the mantle can be used to turn turbines and create electrical power, and you wouldn't need atomics. You wouldn't need coal. You wouldn't need gas or oil. Um, the very geothermal energy of the Earth would be enough to provide power. That's, that's one, one dream of a future without fossil fuels. It could also create a bunch of man-made volcanoes that go out of control. We don't know. I picture this a lot like going to an ice cream place in the summertime and ordering a vanilla soft serve ice cream cone. That's the mantle. But I want chocolate shell on it. If you don't know what chocolate shell is, you've had a deprived childhood and you need to find out. Chocolate shell is delightful. And what it is, is uh, the person at the ice cream store dips your cone into this liquid. And when it comes out of the liquid, the chocolate solidifies almost immediately. It has to do with the way the, that that particular chocolate works. Some of you may work in an ice cream shop. You may know more about it than I do. So you're given a cone that may have some vanilla peeking through, but that's covered with a thin chocolatey layer that matches the shape of the soft serve, serve cone before. But you better start eating it soon because what will happen is the chocolate shell will crack and fissure and the vanilla will start licking, leaking through. Now you can eat the chocolate shell easily, but when you eat the chocolate shell, you've also created a gap and you've got to eat the soft serve before it melts away. So if you will, the earth is like a bowling ball surrounded by soft serve ice cream with chocolate shell on the surface. And we live on the surface of the chocolate shell. And lest you doubt my veracity or my wisdom in telling you this, we believe in a theory called plate tectonics about how continents interact with one another. Because the surface of the earth, the crust, is already cracked into plates that move in harmony or in uh, dissonance, dissonance against one another, like the cracked pieces of a chocolate shell. So, we've got the core, we've got the mantle, we've got the crust. The crust could also be called the lithosphere. Lithosphere. And the lithosphere is from uh, lithos, which means rock. So, the lithosphere or the crust, now I'll call it the crust on the quiz just letting you know, is the surface of the Earth. But that's not all. As the surface of the Earth cools, the gaseous mix of gunk around the Earth also begins to cool. And it begins to rain. For thousands of years, it rains. The water vapor that is a part of the soupy, poisonous atmosphere of, of the early fusion Earth is going to fill the deepest basins of the world, the basalt regions of the world, as oceans. So rain falls on the early Earth as the surface cools, covering, what is it? Three-fifths of the world's surface? 70%. 70%. Yeah, even better. Three-fifths of 60%. So 70% of the world is covered by this watery film, which is called the hydrosphere. The hydrosphere rests on the lithosphere, or the crust. The hydrosphere is the watery layer that covers so much of the surface of the Earth. So core, mantle, crust, hydrosphere which is mostly ocean. Now, the early ocean is not something you would want anything to do with because of all the iron ore in the basins of the earth that are filled. The early oceans rust. Imagine oceans filled with rust. Ugh. But eventually the rust settles out and you end up with salt water because of the minerals uh, in the ocean. And... Um, the history of the world is going to proceed apace. Now, above the hydrosphere, can you guess? Above the hydrosphere, 
is the atmosphere. The gaseous sphere around the watery partial sphere around the lithosphere over the mantle over the core. The atmosphere allows us, once plants colonize the land, to breathe and uh, protects us from certain types of cosmic radiation with things like the ozone layer. And basically is one of the things, along with liquid water on the surface, that creates life as we know it, carbon-based life. Now, you could argue that the atmosphere and the hydrosphere are variants of the same thing. I am not going to do that because I think there's a distinction that should be made <laughs> between the watery parts of the world and the airy parts of the world. But they do interact. The water cycle, for example, evaporated water forms clouds, clouds rain, and that rain goes back into the oceans and evaporates again. Now, above or around or within the upper atmosphere is a very important part of the Earth, the magnetosphere. The magnetosphere is a single magnetic field, which some scientists, who make sense to me, believe is produced by the counter-rotating core against the rotating Earth. So, let's see, there's east, there's west, the sun rises in the east, so the earth is going this way on the surface. So that would mean that the earth would, so that's clockwise from my point of view, counterclockwise from your point of view. So the core would be counter-rotating, it would be rotating in the opposite fashion. If the surface is clockwise, it would be counterclockwise and vice versa. In any event, the earth has a single magnetic field the positive uh, magnetic pole and the negative magnetic pole, the North Pole and the South Pole. Where's the positive pole the South Pole? That's interesting. Because magnet magnets are drawn to the North, in any event. Positive and negative poles. Do any of you know which is the positive pole? I'm sure you do. I think it might be the North Pole. It would seem, the way I've heard it, the North Pole, it's just why would a positive pole attract magnetite and magnetized iron towards it. North is that way. Uh, and anyway, I'll take your word for it. it. It seems right. It seems like what I've heard. So we have a planetary magnetic field, and that pl planetary magnetic field acts as an energy shield to protect the Earth from gamma rays and cosmic radiation. Then we have the moon. The moon tends to attract and catch a lot of solid debris that would otherwise hit the Earth. Look at the surface of the moon. Many of the things that hit the moon would have otherwise hit the Earth. Uh, we've got the magnetosphere to keep out certain kinds of cosmic rays and radiation. We've got the atmosphere that filters out others. And also, the atmosphere protects us from a lot of the solid objects in space. You have a mountain-sized piece of iron flying through space called a meteor, and uh, it's approaching the Earth. You want it to hit the atmosphere. In hitting the atmosphere, it might completely burn up. It might shatter into smaller pieces that completely burn up. It might burn up to such an extent that only a small piece, like a Volkswagen-sized piece of uh, uh, celestial iron, hits the Earth, creates a crater like Crater Lake. What we don't want is an Earth that looks like the surface of the moon. The surface of the Earth is a product of the atmosphere and the hydrosphere and life, not of meteor collision, like the surface of the moon is. So all of these things tend to create this, this, this area where we can live on the surface of the earth, in the waters, in the lower airs. We are deep in the sea of air. Atmosphere is quite thick. Now, we've talked about the oceans rusting, then clarifying. Why doesn't Mr. Gennario just accept that man-made climate change is real, is settled science? So many scientists believe it. How, how, how can he, a mere historian, doubt the, the conclusions of so many scientists? Well, first of all, because other scientists disagree. There is actually a divide within the scientific community about man-made climate change. It's just the media is very much cheerleading one side. 
The other reason is studying history, both natural and human. Ah, climate is never stable. It always is in the process of slowly or quickly changing. One of the most graphic examples of this is when the atmosphere cools to such an extent that it freezes. It basically becomes indistinguishable from the hydrosphere. At not one, but two points in the early Earth's history, the Earth was surrounded by a solid sphere of ice, a frozen atmosphere combined with the frozen oceans. And one of these happened after life first appears. So life manages to survive under the deep ice of iceberg Earth, of snowball Earth, which is one of the reasons why we think that the moon of Jupiter, Europa, might very well be capable of supporting our type of life because it is in a state very similar to the iceberg or snowball period periods in Earth's history when the atmosphere uh, solidified. But this doesn't remain. The oceans come back, the air is freed, and life is ready to happen. So the Earth forms around 4 billion years ago, the Sun forms around 5 billion years ago, 3.8 billion years ago, in the ocean, at a time when the air is not only poisonous, but does not have the many layers to protect us from the deadly cosmic radiations that exist, deep in the watery bosom of the oceans, amino acids come together and form life. We don't know how. God may have spake and said, let there be life. And there was life. And the life was good. And the evening and the morning of the whatever day. Or lightning. Or just you form complex proteins and eventually the proteins work. I don't know. I do know that the scientific community has a rough consensus that around 3.8 billion years ago, Life first appears. And when life first, ap first appears, it has two qualities you should be mindful of. It is both microscopic and aquatic. That's what this is. This is a little looking glass, a magnifying glass, to indicate that all of this is microscopic. It's microscopic and it's aquatic. Now, in your notes where we are, which is on the page after the Earth, uh, diagram. We're on item 41, I'm sorry, 42. Let's see. Yip, 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 yip. Where am I? Oh, okay. No, we're not on 30, okay. We're on 20. I got lost. <laughs> Item 20, about 3.8 billion, uh, billion years ago. You have thousands, uh, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions. Trillions. <laughs> thousands of thousands of millions. It's, it's, it's un, unimaginable, un, unimaginably big. Okay. Occurs in amino acid rich water. Who knows what happened? But the process of life begins. Now, how do we know something is alive? Well, first of all, life is not self-sufficient. Life must consume in order to survive. The state of living requires consumption. That's eating. That's drinking. We must devour food to replenish our nutrients. The earliest life forms do that. The earliest life forms are, are very similar to a very basic virus. So we know it's alive because it eats. What does it eat? Who knows? Uh, the process of life where a life form discards waste matter. Well, this is the other byproduct of consumption. When you eat things, you're not converting it 100% into useful material. There is waste matter. And that waste matter must be eliminated. So, does it eat? Yeah, might be alive. Does it eliminate the waste 
from eating. Yeah, then it may be alive. So it eats and it goes to the bathroom. Item 23. The process of life in which a life form replenishes chemicals, oxygen or carbon dioxide, next necessary for the basis, basic process of life. Here is a saying, time is the fire in which we burn. A living, a living creature like us is an engine. That's why food is measured in calories. Calories are units of heat energy. So our digestive systems consume food in a process analogous to fire. Therefore, you need oxygen. Plants consume carbon dioxide as a necessary uh, means to them engaging in their processes of life. So does it eat? Does it eliminate? Does it respire? Does it suck and blow? Does it breathe? If it eats, it eliminates and breathes, it's probably alive. And finally, item 24. Life is not immortal. Life is temporary. It is transient. So how does life persist when it dies? It breathes. It, can, it reproduces. So, does it eat? Might be alive. Does it eliminate? Might be alive. Does it breathe? Respire? Might be alive. Does it breed? Reproduce? Might be alive. That's where we are. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. And I will see you at lunch when the sophomores dress me. <laughs> no idea what they're going to do. I just told them they can add clothes on, but I do not want them taking clothes off. <laughs> You also take care. See you guys. Thank you.